Thank you so much for that song. Our scripture today is found in Revelation 15, verses 2 to 4. Found, uh, I'll be reading out of the King James Version. I'll just read the verses that we have chosen right. I say that because this morning I made the goof and I started reading something else. So this morning they got two verses extra than you guys are going to get. This is what they say. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. <clears throat> and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Last week we um, we studied the early life of Moses. You think about what God's people were suffering under the Egyptian bondage. They were not free to worship God. They didn't get a Sabbath rest. They were being forced and dominated for the use of somebody else's glory. And God sent them a deliverer. God heard their cry. When you read in Exodus 1 and 2, God says to Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. I have come down and I will deliver them. You know what? God has done no less for us today. I don't know if you've noticed, I like this symbolism. God sent his son, the prince of heaven, to be born in a manger, to be born in our flesh and blood and to walk in our experience, and yet not to be tainted with sin, but to be the deliverer that we needed. And not just for us, but for the whole human family. <laughs> it's amazing what God has done and what he will do for us if we put our faith and trust in him. Let's talk to him this morning. Father, thank you for bringing us into your house of prayer, a house of prayer for all people. Thank you, Father, that you hear the pleas of the humble. Thank you, Father, that you hear the pleas of the needy. Father, tune our hearts to understand more of our great need of you. Help us see your beauty and your goodness. There's so many things, Father, that are at work to hide who you really are from us or lie to us about who you are. Touch our hearts this morning with who you really are, Father. Faithful, kind, true, abounding in goodness and mercy, long-suffering, and yet just. We love you and thank you. Speak to our hearts this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we looked at these verses, Hebrews 11, 24 through 27, and they tell us that Moses rejected being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He rejected the passing pleasures of sin for a season. He rejected the treasures of Egypt. And as we studied, they were significant. He forsook the crown of Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. In place of these things, he said, I will stand with the people of God. He was in line to the throne of Egypt. 
But he, he said no to that so that he could stand with the people of God. He said no to the passing pleasures of sin so, and chose to suffer affliction with God's people. He rejected the treasures of Egypt in place. He took the reproach of Christ. And instead of the crown of Egypt, he looked to the reward that God would give. You know what Paul says? There is laid up for me a crown which the king, the righteous one, will put on me, and not me also, but all those who love is appearing. Moses looked to that reward, and he esteemed the things of Egypt in comparison as nothing. But the next verse here in Hebrews, the next two verses, is what we're going to study this morning. Just two short verses. It says, By faith Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. And as I read these two, this is the last that we hear of Moses in the book of Hebrews. The last that we hear of his faith. I ask myself the question, why these two incidents in the life of Moses? There's many other things, other acts of faith that Moses did. Why didn't he tell us about the manna episode? Why didn't he tell us about this, the poisonous snakes coming out and Moses lifting up a defeated snake on the pole? Why didn't he tell us about bringing water from the rock or holding up his, his uh, rod until the Amalekites were defeated by Joshua? Or any of the other things that Moses did? Why these two? By faith, they kept the Passover lamb. What, what was involved with that? By faith, they selected a lamb on the 10th day of the month, and on the 14th day of the month, they slaughtered it and put the blood on the, on the posts of their homes. By faith that night, they went to bed, trusting that the angel of God would pass by their homes if he saw the blood marked on the door. Because they knew that every other home, there was going to be the death of, a, of all the firstborn that were in the home. And by faith, they ate that meal with their sandals on their feet and their staff in hand and their things packed and ready to go because God said, at midnight, I will deliver you. It's interesting, those of you who have read the book, Great Controversy, when is it that God acts and delivers his people? It's at midnight. By faith, they did these things, the Bible says. Also, when they came to the Red Sea, by faith, God said, go forward. When there appeared to be no way forward, and God divided the sea and made a way, and they escaped from certain death. And by faith, they went forward. What would it have been like to, to walk between two walls of water, 1,000, 1,400 foot high on either side? What would that have been like? By faith, they went forward. By faith, they heard the command of God and obeyed it. And what did they find? All those who obeyed and followed God. What did they find on the other side? They found that he was faithful. They found that he saved them. I want to talk a little bit about faith today. Faith versus presumption. Faith, true faith, hears the words of God and obeys, trusting that he will reward obedience in due time. Does God always immediately reward our obedience? When we do the right thing, have you ever done the right thing and felt like you got punished for it? Have you? Hold on. What does the Bible say? God takes note of everything that we have done. And in the day of reckoning, he will repay. Have you shown kindness when you were treated with abuse? God knows. Have you done the right thing in your business even though it cost you personally? God knows. He will repay. You may not see the reward 
right now, but he will repay. But presumption, this is what presumption is. Presumption claims the right to the promises and privileges of God without first complying with the conditions. In other words, presumption says, God, you do this for me without doing what God has asked for us, without obedience. That's the difference between faith and presumption. And going back to this, going back to this verse here, Hebrews 11, 29. By faith, the Israelites passed through the Red Sea. Who told them to go through the Red Sea? God. Who divided the sea so they could go through there? God. What about the Egyptians? Did God tell the Egyptians, now you go follow my people and try to destroy them? Did he tell them that? They presumed to do that. They did not fall, they were not obedient to God. They presumed to go into the sea and the result was that they were drowned. Faith grabs hold of the word of God and obeys. Hebrews 11 verse 1 tells us this also about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes in our obedience, we don't immediately see the thing that God promised. The reward for obedience. We don't immediate see, immediately see the positive outcome. But faith moves forward anyway in obedience. How many of you cooks know what this seed is right here? Looks like lentils. It's smaller than that. No, nope, smaller than coriander. Mustard seed. All right, so some of you guys need to... I, I use a little bit of mustard seed sometimes when I'm doing Indian cooking. I love Indian cooking, but I'm not, I'm not an Indian cook, but I like, I like the flavors. But what did Jesus say about the mustard seed? If you have faith as small as a, as a mustard seed, you can move mountains. You know, this, um, this little seed, Jesus said, becomes, it's the smallest of all the garden herb seeds. But Jesus says, what does it become? The largest of everything you grow in the garden. In this little seed, you mean to tell me you're going to have a bush in which birds are going to roost and, and build their nests in? That's because God put it into the seed to be able to do that. That's, that's what faith, faith is. You don't see it yet, but you know it's a reward. So the, the book of Hebrews 11 gives us also this definition of faith. Faith is action when all we see is the promise, not the reality, okay? So let that sink in. Faith is appropriate action, appropriate belief when all you see is the promise or the word of God. So the Bible says, and this is from the Hebrews 11, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Were any of us there to see it? But can we believe it because the one who does not lie has told us? That's what faith is, believing it without having seen. Also this, God warned Noah of a flood that was coming. What did the faith that was in Noah lead him to do? Build a boat, what else did he do to the people that were living at that time? He preached a message of warning, right? So faith, God says, this is what's coming. It hasn't arrived yet. But faith grabs hold of the word of God and in obedience to it, prepares. Also, God called Abraham to leave his country and says, I'm going to give you an inheritance in a country that you don't know about yet. Leave your family, leave your country behind. What did Abraham do? What did Abraham's faith compel him to do? <coughs> Obey the word of God and move out. The Bible also tells us that God promised Sarah a son in her old age. And yes, both Abraham and Sarah both laughed. But the Bible does say that by Sarah's faith, she received strength to conceive. She believed the promise and by receiving the strength that God supplied, she received a son. And last week, through the testimony of Josephus, we saw that Amram was promised by a heavenly messenger that this son would be the deliverer of his people. And when Amram said, I can no longer protect Moses, which he didn't even have that name at that point yet, but I can no longer protect this little one, 
They made an ark of bulrushes and pushed him out onto the Nile, trusting that God would fulfill his word and spare the life of this child because he was going to be the deliverer. See, faith moves to action and obedience when all we see is the promise. And here's a key verse. Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, what? Obeyed. Obeyed. I want you, if you take nothing else away from that, this is, this is the definition of faith. Faith is obedience to God's word even before we receive the final reward because we judge the one who promised as faithful. I want, you to, I want that to sink in. You know, as I was, as I was studying this this week, um, does God promise a reward to those who love him and keep his commandments? Yes, he does. What does God promise to the wicked? Weeping and gnashing of teeth and final destruction. Right? So faith would be to hear that life and death are both set before us and with Joshua to choose life. To bring my life in harmony with the law of God, in harmony with what he's asked and with his will, so that I can receive the promise. But if I do not bring my life in harmony, and I am I over here, but I still want the promises and privileges, am I exercising faith anymore? I'm exercising presumption. I'm presuming it's demanding that God give me the promises without meeting the conditions. So faith is obedience to God's word even before we receive the final reward. You know, there's a verse that says pretty much that in Hebrews 11:6. 6. This is how it says it. Without faith, it's impossible to please him because true faith always leads to obedience and without obedience, we can't please God. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If we live a life in harmony with God and we, we ask Jesus every day to cleanse us from our sins and live out his life in us, the day, when we come to the day of judgment, when we come to that final day, if we're being faithful in all that God has told us to do, do you think his promises are going to fall flat? No. They're not. Faith always leads to obedience. Here's another passage in Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The word of God. Faith is hearing the word of God and bringing my life into harmony with that word because I believe that what the one who promised or said is true. Let me ask you, let me, let me ask you, you know the story of Jonah. When Jonah preached in, in Nineveh, and he said, yet 40 days and God will destroy this city. Did the people of Nineveh believe his message? Yes. What did they do in harmony with the message? They humbled themselves with sackcloth and ashes. They repented before God of their evil deeds, right? They believed, and did they avert disaster that was determined upon them? They believe God. They took action. See, this is what faith does. Faith believes what God says, acts in harmony with it, and receives the reward. This is what faith is. There's a lot of faith that's being taught today that is nothing more than presumption. It's not based on the Word of God, and it's not based on a willingness to obey. There's a lot of name it and claim it kinds of theology out there, the prosperity. Just believe it and it will be so. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change your life. But God always has conditions for us to meet. True faith will lead us to obey and to trust in God and to do what he says. So false faith reasons like this. God loves me. Is that true? Yes, it is. God gave the life of his son for me. Is that true? Yes, it is. 
God will save me if I make a profession of faith. Is that true? You know, somebody might quote Romans 10, 13 and say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in the truest sense and in the fullest sense, that is true. When a sinner feels his guilt and his necessity before God and humbly, like, you remember Jesus told the story of two men that went to the temple to pray and one of those men beat his breast He wouldn't even look up to heaven and he cried, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He called to the Lord in faith, humility, and repentance. Did that man receive salvation? Jesus said he did. But a mere proclamation that exits the mouth is not enough because Jesus also said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does what? Who's going to enter the kingdom? The one who has enough faith in what God said to obey and bring their life in harmony with what God has asked. And I want to be very clear. You cannot serve God from the heart in a way that will be meaningful to him or to you unless you have the renewing, regenerating power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Because you can do the externals and God knows you're just doing the externals. And tell me, are you pleased if you're just doing the externals and your heart isn't in it? It's drudgery. It's horrible. But when God plants love in your heart and he gives you new desires to keep his commandments and then by faith you say, in the strength that you supply, I will obey and I will do it from my heart. Not only do you have joy, but now it's pleasing to God. As as Hebrews 11 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. But faith, true faith, always leads to obedience. True faith speaks like this. Jesus has justified me because he's died for my sins and I've put my faith and trust in him. I've confessed my sins. I've repented of my sins. And now I can claim the promise that I'm right with God, even if I don't feel like it. If you have confessed your sins and you have turned away in heart, you know, God's the one who gives us the gift of repentance. If your heart is still attached to your sin, you have the right and the privilege as a blood-bought son or daughter of God to say, God, my heart longs for this. Give me what? A A new heart. Take this desire for evil and wickedness out of me and give me something better. You have the right to ask for that by the blood of Jesus. Faith in Jesus also cleanses us because what does 1 John 1, 9 say? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But what else? To cleanse us from that unrighteousness internally. To take that wicked thought, that wicked thing out of us and give us something better. True faith lays hold of Christ, I'm accepted in the beloved. That's what Ephesians 1, 6 says. When I accept Christ, how does the Father feel about Christ? It's his son who never did anything wrong, who, who gave his life to save all of us. God loves his son. And when I am in Jesus, how does God now feel about me? He feels the same way as he does about Jesus. Think about that. Do you know what? Many of us spend our whole lives trying to earn the acceptance or the recognition or the love or respect of people in our own family, people in our sphere of influence, maybe people at work. You know what? You know what? God has already accepted you in Jesus Christ. The only question is, are you in Jesus Christ? And if you are, you have that peace that comes. You know what? Satan does a, long, a lot of working on us to say, you've done this, you've done that, you're horrible, you can't turn back now, God doesn't want you. That's a lie. All of that. God gave his only son to wash us free of our sins and to redeem us, to bring us back to himself. If God paid such a high price for us, you think, you think that when we actually come to him, he's going to say, no, I don't want you now? Not a chance. You and I both know that if you make an expensive purchase and it's being delivered, if two or three days go by, you you just dropped $500 on whatever it is, a generator, a television, I don't know, 
and it's coming two or three days and it's not there, you start, you start making some phone calls, right? Where is this? God paid an infinite price for us. Infinite price. He wants to see us safe in his kingdom. This is how faith speaks. How faith speaks. Jesus has saved me not only from the penalty of my sins, but also from its power. Because the angel told Mary and Joseph in Matthew 121, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will what? Save his people from their sins. Remember that woman that was caught in adultery? That woman that was ensnared by the lies of Satan and thought, I am just a harlot. I can never be more than a harlot. And she was cast before the feet of Jesus. And she expected to receive condemnation and be stoned on the spot. And after Jesus wrote every man's sin in the ground and they had all left and it was just him and her. Jesus said to that woman, where are your accusers, woman? And she said, does anyone accuse you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said to her, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Look, if Jesus has power to save us from the penalty of sin, Jesus has power to save us from this life of sin that we are trapped in. Because that's what the angel said. He will save his people, not in their sins, but from their sins. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 1. I, I got a couple, of, yeah, go, go to Romans. We're going we're gonna to be there in Romans chapter 1. But I want to tell you, I want to show you these other verses. Um, the Bible says in Ephesians that Jesus gave his life so that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Now that's speaking of the church by the washing of water by the word so that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be what? Holy. Jesus gave his life not just to forgive you, but to make you holy. Are there conditions for God is accepting us? There are. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17, this is what God says. God said, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And if you really think about that, that should just blow your mind because why would God want to dwell with the likes of me? After what I've done, why would he want to come into my heart and be part of my life? I can't answer that question. But that's what the text says, that he wants to be part of my life. But look what else it says. God says this, therefore... Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. God is calling a people for himself out of the world. He says, don't be like the world. Don't live like the world. Don't worship the things that the world worships. You come to me. And when you come to me and you separate yourself from what's going on in the world and you refuse to touch that which I've said is unclean, I will receive you. Does Christ receive us? Does God receive us? But are there conditions? There are. And faith complies with the conditions so that we can receive the reward. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We'll start with verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, for the good news. Okay? The good news of God. Verse 2. Which God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Did God promise he was going to send a deliverer? Did he promise that that deliverer would save his people from their sins? Yes. And who did the whole Scriptures testify about? Jesus Christ. Verse 3. What are these, what are these promises and prophecies in the Holy Scriptures, they concern his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. In other words, he came and lived and walked in the same flesh and blood that you have with the same temptations, with the same difficulties. In fact, Jesus probably has suffered a harder life than any of us. He knows what it's like to be poor and destitute and homeless and despised and rejected. But that's what makes him 
able to understand your situation wherever you may be. Verse 4, who was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace. Most of the Christian world, when they see grace, they just think mercy and forgiveness, and that's it. 90% of the time when you read grace, it means power to overcome. Check me on this. Read your Bibles and read that into when you see grace. Notice what verse 5 says. Through Christ, through him, we have received grace and apostleship. Now notice, here's the key phrase. In order to bring about the obedience that comes by faith. Do you see how that works? We receive grace from Jesus in order to bring about an obedience that only can come by faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake. This is the phrase here. The obedience of faith. And, and faith is in the genitive form, which means it's the obedience that belongs to faith or the obedience that accompanies faith, the obedience that comes through faith or the obedience that springs from from faith. We're, this is what we already learned in Hebrews. What is it when men exhibited faith in the book of Hebrews that it led them to do? By faith, Abraham, what? Obeyed. True faith always leads to obedience. And that's what this passage is telling us. That through Jesus Christ, verse 5, we've received grace, that is power, to bring about the obedience that comes by faith. You know this verse, John chapter 1, verse 12, says, as many as received Jesus, to them God gave power to become sons and daughters of God. You and I had only power before to become sons and daughters of the enemy. We have only power in ourselves to do wicked works. But when you receive Jesus, not only do you receive forgiveness, you receive power to do right that you didn't have before. And faith lays hold of that power and then through that power obeys what God has said. So jump down with me to verse 15. Romans 1 verse 15. This is Paul. Paul continues. Thus for my part I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now he's going to tell us what that is. What is the gospel, Paul? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Number one, it's the power of God to save anyone. That's the gospel, okay? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17, number two. The gospel, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested or revealed or displayed from faith unto faith. We're going to study that phrase more. But number two, the gospel... In the gospel, the righteousness of God is now on display. It is manifested. It is brought to real life in the lives of those who believe. As it is written, and this is his proof for that, it's written, the just man or the righteous man shall live by faith. What does true faith always lead us to? We've already studied this from Hebrews 11. What does true faith always lead us to? Obedience. This is why Paul can say we're saved by faith and why the Old Testament can say if you hear my word and obey it, you'll live. Because true faith always leads to obedience. So the just man shall live or the righteous man will live by faith which always leads to obedience. So the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who has faith in him. And in it, the righteousness of God is manifested or shows up in the life. And we're going to study that little phrase that it says, from faith to faith. What is that first thing? We're going to study that. So faith is obedience to God's word. The gospel brings an obedience that comes by faith and the righteousness of God is manifested from faith unto faith. What is, what is this faith unto faith? We're going to talk about it here. Number one, there's a faith that justifies us. 
In other words, there's a faith that sets us right with God because a sinner is not right with God. And we know it. When you do something wrong to someone else, well, say you really did something that was underhanded and dirty, and then you go to the grocery store and you see that person coming down the aisle, what do you do? Do you want to go down that aisle even though there's four items on that aisle that you need to get and you see them coming down the aisle they haven't seen you? Is that where you want to go? I'm going over here, right? You know, what was it that Adam and Eve, when they knew they shouldn't have eaten the fruit, God comes into the garden, what did they do? They hid, they ran. It's the first instinct. We're not right with God when we sin. We, we know we've violated his law. We know we've wounded him. We know we've wounded ourselves. We know we've wounded our neighbors. And it doesn't sit well. You know, people, people have a burden of sin and they don't know that Jesus can take it from them. They have a burden of shame and guilt and they don't know what it's like to live without it. Jesus wants to take that away. But here's the first faith, the faith that justifies us. And what the word justified means, it just means makes us right with God. Romans 5.1 tells us this, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What happened when Jesus went to the cross? Whose sins were put to his account? My sins, your sins. And when we put faith in Jesus, guess what? The burden of those sins is no longer on me. I have a substitute. And you know what? Jesus went to this cross gladly bearing our sins. He says, if I can lighten Troy's load, I will take those sins on myself so he does not have to bear them. If I can lighten Douglas's load and give him salvation in the kingdom, I will take those sins upon myself so he does not have to bear them. Isaiah says that God laid on him the iniquity of how many of us? All of us. So Jesus bore our sins. And then verse 9 of Romans 5 says, much more than having been justified or having been now made right with God through the sacrifice of his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That gives the sinner peace. Like that woman caught in adultery at Jesus' feet, he says, woman, where are those who accuse you? Is there anyone to bring the condemnation of the law upon you? And she says, no one, Lord. And he says to her, neither do I condemn you. There's the justification. He forgave her sins. At the cross, our sins are forgiven. But more than that, there's a faith that sanctifies us. And this is spoken about in Acts chapter 26. God called Paul to open the eyes and to turn the Gentiles from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they might receive forgiveness of sins. There's the cross. And an inheritance among those who are what? Sanctified by faith. Made holy by trust in what God is doing in their life. Not only are your sins forgiven and your past cleansed, but now God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, comes to live his life in you and is transforming your life, purifying you, sanctifying you, making you holy in your own strength. What does the text say? By faith and trust in what I'm doing. By faith and trust in me. Here's another scripture on the same point. Romans 15, 16. Paul is ministering the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable to God, sanctified by what? By the Holy Spirit. See, when we were enemies of God, we had no access to the gift of the Holy Spirit. We had no access to the, you know, what is it that the Holy Spirit comes in, in the life and the heart and through the Holy Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father, you are my God, you are my Father. But while we're con disconnected from God, while we're in our sins, we're separated from him. We don't have that assurance of the Holy Spirit coming to live in the heart. We don't have that in us that say, I am a son of God, I'm a daughter of God and I know this. But the Holy Spirit comes into life after we accept Jesus and he sanctifies us. Another scripture, 1 Peter 1.22. Peter says this, seeing that you have purified your souls, how? By obeying the truth through the Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit has given us for so that now we can from the heart obey. And as we obey and listen to the Holy Spirit, what is it that's happening in our soul? 
We're being purified. We're being sanctified. And notice what it says here. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. In other words, a love that isn't fake. Do you know that the whole essence of the law is love? What this is saying is the Holy Spirit is writing the law of love in your heart. And as you obey the voice of the Spirit, you're, pur you're being purified in mind and heart. So there's a faith not only that justifies us, but also that sanctifies us. And this is what Paul is saying. That we're justified by faith in the blood of Christ. We're made right with God on the basis of what he has done, his perfect life, and taking my sins at the cross. But we're also now sanctified by faith through the Spirit in obedience to the truth, as we learned from 1 Peter 1.22. Go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. I want you to see this too. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what with God? See, this is what justification is. Jesus' life, his righteousness stands in place of mine. My sins go to his account. Now I can go down the aisle and I can meet God at the other end of that aisle because my sins are taken care of. They're forgiven. They're nailed to the cross. Now I have peace with God. But what else does Paul say? Look at this, verse 2. Through whom, through Jesus, through whom also we have access by faith into what? Grace, this grace that causes us to what? To stand. Do you understand that, see, and I told you this before, that grace often, most Christians read it, that's forgiveness, that's mercy. It's power. Because Paul is saying that there is a grace, because notice the language, verse 2. He's already said, by faith, we've been justified by faith, and now we have peace with God. There's our first faith. But here's the second, the faith that sanctifies us. Through Jesus, we have, we also, so this is something else. We also have access by faith into this grace, power, that causes us to stand. We did not have power to stand before we were connected with Christ. We do not have power to stand and choose right before his Holy Spirit lives in us. Paul is talking about that second faith. And, we, and notice how he continues. He says, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The sinner cannot rejoice in hope of the glory of God because his life is out of harmony with God. Only those who have accepted Jesus Christ and now have a new power working within, they can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Are we going to need character in the day of judgment? Amen. Yes. And character, when we have a character that's refined and like Christ, that produces hope. And hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God is being poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul is talking about the second half of faith. A justifying faith at the cross, but a sanctifying faith in the Spirit. You know that the sanctuary taught this exactly? What is the first thing the sinner came to in the sanctuary? The altar of what? Burn offering or the altar of sacrifice. And that's where the lamb was. And he put his hands on the head of the lamb, he confessed his sins, and his sin, his burden of sin was placed on this innocent animal who was a representative of who? Christ. Then that animal was taken and burnt. Christ suffered for my sins and yours so that I could walk out free and at peace with God. But after the altar of incense was a laver of washing. And you know, Ephesians 5 26, I believe, says that Jesus went to the cross so that he could purify a church for himself by the washing of water and the word. Who is it that brings the word of God into the heart? It's the Holy Spirit. Who is it that's the water of life? 
It's the Holy Spirit. He comes in and sanctifies us by faith. So this is what we've learned so far. Number one, faith is obedience to God's word. Number two, the gospel brings about an obedience that only can come by faith. Three, the righteousness of God is manifested in the life of those who receive Jesus at the cross and receive the power that he offers. That's what it means from faith unto faith. We're justified by faith in the blood of the Lamb and we're sanctified by obeying the truth in the Spirit. There's a lot of voices today that are saying that God didn't really mean what he said. You won't surely die. Obedience isn't necessary to enter the kingdom. You're a sinner. God understands that. He knows you can't help yourself. Just do your best. God will cover the rest. Have you heard that? God doesn't want you to be unhappy in a marriage. God doesn't want you to suffer because you're keeping the Sabbath and you won't have a job. God understands. Don't listen to that voice. By faith, obey what God has asked you to do. And you may not receive the word immediately, but the reward will be there. True faith hears God's word and obeys, trusting that he will reward the obedience in due time. But presumption claims the promises and privileges of God without first complying with the conditions. So why did Paul specifically mention Passover and the, and the crossing at the Red Sea? You tell me, what did the blood of this lamb on the doorpost represent for the children of Israel in Egypt? Whose blood was symbolized when they put it on their doorpost and house? Jesus. By faith. Notice this passage. I'm sorry. The passage that we read to start with, this is Hebrews 11:28. By faith, Moses kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. You know what the rest of the verse says? This is what it says. Lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. The blood of the lamb spared their life in Egypt, did it not? Notice what the Bible says now about Christ's sacrifice. More than, much more than having now been justified by what? By his blood, we are spared or saved from what? The wrath of God through him. So why does Paul mention the Passover? Specifically that Moses, as, as an act of faith by Moses, because it points to the cross, the beginning of our faith. But that's not all he mentioned, because he mentioned the Red Sea. Why did Paul point us to the Red Sea crossing? What in the Christian experience does the Red Sea crossing point us to? Baptism. Baptism. Bingo. Here's a scripture that tells us that. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, Paul speaking, I do not want you to be ignorant or unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It's a symbol of baptism. What did Jesus say about baptism? Take a look at this. John 3, 5. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water, that's baptism, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And this is not saying, oh, you can just be dipped and you're golden, right? What is this saying? Being immersed in the water is symbolic of another power living in your life. It's the Holy Spirit power. And what God is telling us, through Paul, who's saying, that Moses kept the Passover and Moses and they passed through the Red Sea, he is saying no one is getting into the kingdom without the justifying blood of Christ and no one is getting into the kingdom without a renewal of heart that works by the Spirit being baptized into Christ. These are vital. And that's why Paul chose those two moments Unless your sins and your old man are crucified, 
And you're justified by the life of the spotless blood of, by the spotless Lamb of God. And unless you receive the presence and power of the Holy Spirit cleansing your hearts by faith from wicked works, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Listen, Jesus died to take away our sins. He died to make us right with God. It's a done deal. The only question is, do you receive it? Do you accept it? Do you? I pray you do. I pray that you do. You know what? Sometimes Satan's voice is right there to say, you know what? You can't. You can't. You've done too much. Or sometimes our own voice, we're sitting there thinking, if I choose God, I won't be able to do this, this, and this anymore, and I really like doing this. You know what? Look, don't let yourself be stopped from choosing God by thinking that way. God has power to take these things out of your life. Accept what Jesus has done for you. Say, God, I want to be right with you. I'm tired of being overwhelmed by my own guilt and shame. And then receive the gift of Jesus. Receive access to the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you have power to get rid of these things in the first place. And to have a new heart that doesn't want to do those things anymore. Come to Jesus just as you are. And he will make the changes in you. Notice this scripture. This is an encouraging scripture to me. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What does all of this have to do with the song of Moses and the Lamb? Earth's final scenes are being acted out right now. And time is short. Jesus is about ready to return to save his people. And Satan is going to stir the pot on earth and among churches and governments to compel men to worship a false god and bow down to an idol. And will either bow down and receive the mark of the beast or receive the beast's wrath. But God is going to deliver us. Notice, this was the scripture we opened up with this morning, Revelation 15, 2 through 4. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. What does a sea mingled with fire look like? What color is that going to be? It's going to be a red sea. This is a parallel to what God, the victory God won over the Egyptians. I saw something like a sea of glass. Because were not the Egyptians coming to destroy all the Israelites? They were. Were not the Israelites coming to enslave the Israelites? Were they not coming to force them not to worship God and not to have a Sabbath? All of these things are in play at the end of time. They sang of the song of Moses, the, song, the servant of God. You know, when was it that Israel sang the song of Moses? On the other side of the Red Sea. When all the enemies were destroyed, they sang and rejoiced to God. And they sang the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. These are the things that they got victory over. Victory over the beast. Revelation tells us that they're trying to make the whole world worship the beast. But the first commandment says you shall have no other gods before me. Don't worship anything else except for God. But the beast is trying to get everyone to worship him. The second commandment is you shall make no graven images nor shall you bow down for them. And that's why this group gets the victory over his image. The third commandment is you shall not take my name in vain. Do you know the Israelites weren't even supposed to have the name of other gods on their lips? God says, you shall not even mention the name of other gods, but you shall take your oaths in my name. And here, God's people are getting the victory over the number of his name. And lastly, the fourth commandment, God says, remember my Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
And we know from the book of Revelation and from the writings of Ellen White also that the mark of the authority of this power is in opposition to the fourth commandment. These people who by faith are overcoming have gotten victory at every point in which the beast is trying to make them be unfaithful to God. And this is what Revelation 14, 12 says. Here is the patience or the endurance of the saints. This is how the saints endure the final crisis, is what that means. Here are they who are loyal and keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. What does faith always lead to? Obedience. And the faith of Jesus is that no matter what, how bleak things may look now, I know the one in whom I have believed. And I know that faithfulness to him will bring the reward. That was the faith that Jesus had in the garden where he said, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Because I believe that on the other side of this, you're going to overturn every evil and dark, wicked thing that is going to happen to me. And you are going to redeem not only my life, but the life of my whole church. This is the faith of Jesus. This is the faith that we need in our day. Faith that perseveres and keeps the commandments of God and lays hold on the faith, on the promises of God. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, there's much that we have thought about here from your word this morning. And Father, I speak, as, I speak as a member of this sinful race when I say there is no faithfulness in me. But Father, I ask for your faithfulness. And with the disciples, I ask, Lord, increase our faith. Give us faith and trust to believe, to believe and trust that your word is sure to believe and trust that if we obey you and serve you, we will have a reward. And Father, give us faith to believe that we're made right with you by the blood of the Lamb and that you will give us your spirit that we might obey you and serve you from the heart. Give us this faith, Father, that we may be found faithful. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.